Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Royal Institute of Philosophy's annual debate. I'm actually told that it's World Philosophy Day. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> Sorry. Um, my name's Ritala Shah. I'm going to be chairing tonight's discussion. What's the point of diversity? It's a subject that's rarely out of the headlines these days. Um, my lived experience is through the prism of racism. Um, and my, aware, my awareness of being diverse came up pretty early. I used to go to primary school in a London borough, which is now one of the most diverse places in England. But when I went to school way back in the midst of time, I was the only brown kid at my school. Um, and I was there from reception. Several years later, things were changing, racism had ratcheted up, walking home from school one day, and I get stopped by two of the school bullies. Robert, one of them, has known me since I was in reception. John's a bit newer to the school. John starts pushing me about, you know, I get called a few names. And then there's a, suddenly there's a moment and Robert gallantly intervenes and says, she ain't a packy, she's just got a suntan. <laughs> Diversity takes many forms and I've been topping up my suntan ever since. Um, back to tonight, I hope we'll discuss why diversity in all its forms is something that we are talking about a lot. Why, who gets left out? Who gets included? What does its promotion mask? Is it about its ubiquity? Does it that have an intrinsic value? Is it fair to say that it's a topic that many people feel passionately about? Well, we can talk about all of that. And I'm going to ask this event to be robust, polite. There'll be a chance for all of you to ask questions. Um, but let's have a really intelligent debate. Looking forward to it enormously. Let me introduce the panel. Baroness Honora O'Neill is president of the Royal Institute of Philosophy and combines writing on political philosophy and ethics with a range of public activities. Among the posts she's held, and this is just a few of them, she was principal of Newnham College, Cambridge, and president of the British Academy. She's been a crossbench member of the House of Lords since 2000 and has chaired the UK's Equality and Human Rights Commission for four years. In 2017, she was awarded the Holberg Prize and the Begruen Prize for philosophy and culture. Tommy J. Curry is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. He holds a personal chair in Africana Philosophy and Black Male Studies. He's the author of The Man Not, Race, Class, Genre, and the Dilemmas of Black Manhood, which won the 2018 American Book Award. A year earlier, his public intellectual work earned him the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy's Alan Locke Award. He's also a past president of Philosophy Born of Struggle, one of the eldest black philosophy organizations in the United States. And Professor Kathleen Stock's research interests include the philosophy of fiction and imagination and the nature of sexual and other forms of objectification and on the nature of sexual orientation. Her book, Only Imagine, Fiction, Interpretation and Imagination, was published by the Oxford University Press in 2017. She's also a prolific public philosopher whose many articles, essays and op-eds can be found at kathleenstock.com. Welcome to you all. Uh, just to give everybody a sense of how this evening is going to work, we're going to begin by hearing um, each of your thoughts in turn. I'm going to ask each of the panellists one or two questions after they've spoken, and then we'll have an opportunity for all of you to ask questions and things. There'll be a broader discussion. So let's begin with Honora O'Neill. What's the point of diversity? Your thoughts first, please. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. And let me start with just asking the question, is diversity a good thing? Why do we think it's a good thing? <clears throat> which forms of diversity matter? Which are good, which are bad? Let me start with a very early memory, which some of you may share. It used to be quite common to see in houses uh, and flats a, a, a little postcard, and on it, a couplet written by Robert Louis Stevenson, which read, the world is so full of a number of things, I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings. Um, and as a child, I found this couplet pretty irritating. Why should more things or even more diverse things mean that we will be or we should be happier? And how happy are kings anyhow? Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. So I start with the question, what's the point of diversity? Is more diversity always better? Or is diversity not really the fundamental matter, although we discuss it a lot today? Um, I think that 
one can see one of the sources of present debates about diversity in um, the Equality Act 2010, which when I chaired the Equality and Human Rights Commission was of course the fundamental piece of legislation. And in there, we find a list of so-called protected characteristics, um, uh, which uh, 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 must be respected and where there are in fact legal penalties for failure so to do. Um, and the forms of diversity that are listed in the Act, there are quite few. Um, but I think the rationale for them is that these are features of people that might be the basis of unfair discrimination, unfair treatment. And the nine protected characteristics, many of you will be familiar with the list, are age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex, and sexual orientation. It's a rather untidy list in some way. Now, I don't think that many people would disagree that these characteristics shouldn't be used as a basis for certain sorts of discrimination, and that doing so would be a form of unfairness, and that we're right to protect these characteristics. But that abstract thought isn't going to offer us complete guidance. It certainly doesn't mean that treatment of persons with any one of these characteristics has to be uniform with the treatment of persons with other characteristics. For example, we all accept that in many respects we need to treat persons differently based on their age. You try teaching a, treating a 14-year-old like a 4-year-old and you'll find out fast enough that that doesn't wash. Um, and. Uh, we do treat people differently depending on the particular nature of their disabilities, and rightly so. Um, and uh, again, uh, in taking account of specific religious beliefs. That, I think, is one of the reasons why respecting these standards is very complex and needs careful guidance. And that, of course, is one of the things that the Equality and Human Rights Commission does. I'll go to this one. Is this one going to work better? Yes. Okay, now we've learned something. Um, there are many, many other characteristics which it would be also be unacceptable, unfair, to use as the basis for discrimination, not just the nine that I listed. For, just think of some of the obvious examples. Would it be acceptable to discriminate on the basis of people's place of birth? or the language they speak at home? When is it acceptable to, to discriminate on the basis of nationality? That's a very interesting one. I don't expect you to treat me any differently from any other UK citizen because I come from Northern Ireland, but I might accept that there's a different basis for the tre treating those who are citizens of the United Kingdom and those who are citizens of other states. On the other hand, there are contexts in which discriminating on the basis of certain characteristics is not merely acceptable, but, wait for it, desirable. Selecting for a sports team, consider that. Surely you want to select on the basis of athletic competence, competence at the sport. Job appointments, surely you want to appoint someone who is a reliable performer, whatever it is. And more generally, what about discrimination on the basis of professional qualification and relevant experience? All these characteristics are acceptable bases of discrimination. So I think we have to conclude that that list of protected characteristics in the 2010 Act is highly selective. It's a selective list of some matters that should not be treated as a basis for differentiated treatment or discrimination. But it is not, and it does not purport to be a complete list. It's silent about many matters that are acceptable bases for drawing distinctions, and it does not offer a complete recipe for the requirements for fairness. So in summary, the Equality Act 2010 is about not treating certain irrelevant characteristics as a basis for discrimination. But we often need to, 
and are required to take account of relevant characteristics. And what's relevant is going to vary with the task at hand. In appointments processes, for example, jobs must go to those with the necessary qualifications rather than to those who are simply unqualified for the job. In selecting for a sports team, we look for recent form, not recent lack of form. Let me come now to disproportionality, which is another term that has uh, become much more popular in the last decade. Disproportionality may, I think, be an indicator of discrimination. We see many complaints that selection on the basis of certain characteristics produces, or perhaps has produced, what is referred to as disproportionality. For example, it's perfectly true, most judges are of a certain age, quite a high age, and most of them are men. Is that evidence of wrongful discrimination against young people or against women? Most primary school teachers are women. Is that evidence of wrongful discrimination against men? In many places of work, the proportion of people of varied backgrounds simply does not match the proportion of people of that background in the population. Is such disproportionality always wrong? If so, why? When or why might it be wrong? I think that the conclusion that's usually drawn is this. Disproportionality in itself isn't wrong, since fairness rather than proportionality is what we care about. But disproportionality can be a sign of something wrong. For example, of ineffective recruiting or failure to recruit from certain sections of the population, of unconscious or conscious bias. Most of the remedies that are used to address disproportionality attend to these process matters. So it's not the proportions and certain outcomes that are decisive for fairness, but the processes by which outcomes are produced. Disproportionality, I suggest, is a symptom, but it isn't the basic issue. Thank you. Honora Neal, if I can pick you mm. up on that, that mm. very final point mm. about disproportionality, you're suggesting that diversity in the way we try to practice it is only dealing with the perceived problem, the process that we use, and in the most superficial way. So is, is our discussion around diversity, our, our attempts to try and impose diversity, then rather misplaced? I think that there's every reason to welcome diversity, but that it isn't the aim. It's not what we're going for. Uh, I would draw one exception. I think when you come to matters of belief, uh, meeting beliefs that differ from your own belief is positively valuable. That really does have uh, an impact. And the idea that we should cocoon ourselves in a, uh, an echo chamber of, of like-mindedness is pretty damaging. Uh, but uh, in other matters, it seems to me that the exact proportions are not the issue. The issue is, do people with diverse characteristics get a fair deal in applying for certain jobs or applying for certain courses or whatever it may be? So if one takes it that fairness is what ultimately matters, I don't think one looks just at the pattern that exists. I believe we did have reason to worry when there were no women judges, for example. Um, but on the other hand, I cannot see the arguments that might be made for thinking that we have to get exactly the same proportion of women and men in any particular walk of life. So does diversity as a policy instrument become rather blunt, potentially rather damaging? I think that if... if if somebody tells me that diversity is their aim, I will say, is it your real aim? Or is your real aim something more like fairness? Uh, because uh, just trying to, uh, as it were, get the proportions of the uh, population doing various things to fit a certain template so that, for example, now, where it's something compulsory, it's different. For example, 
primary school, and you referred to your primary school, um, given that the proportion of small boys and small girls in the population tends in most places to be roughly equal, although some of you will have noted the interesting correspondence about the villages where there are only little girls or only little boys, which because of uh, the statistical nature of this it was inevitable. But uh, you would expect overall in a sufficiently large town, the proportion of boys and girls in the primary school to be equal because every child has to attend. But I don't think you would expect the number of uh, girls playing soccer necessarily to equal the number of boys playing soccer or the number of boys going to the ballet classes to equal the number of girls going to the ballet classes, those being optional matters. Thank you very much. Hold on to those thoughts. Think about your questions. Tommy Carey. Uh, so when I first heard the, the topic of this debate, uh, it was some somewhat upselling. Uh, in the United States, when someone asks, what's the point of diversity, you're pretty sure there are white supremacists or alt-right supporter. Uh, so let me begin by saying that, of course, I support diversity. Uh, but I think that the term diversity uh, often accompanies what I take to be an outright denial of racial hostility and discrimination. When we speak about diversity, it's a way of legitimizing the actions of systems that are constituted illegitimately and based on a discriminatory history and practice. So by the very utterance of the word, we assume that we're here to invite people to be included, and we're trying to simply find out which criterion should be used for their inclusion. But what often happens here is that this piecemeal kind of reform often ends up denying how the situation was constituted in the first place, how a practically homogenous white population occupies UK universities or the field of philosophy in the United States. So the effect of histories of discrimination is in fact not the cultivation of empathy for wrongdoings, but a certain kind of power. The power to define the meaning of diversity or the inclusion of new people and ideas, and more importantly, the speed by which diversification actually happens. In this way, whites still control and maintain structures of access, and what kinds of difference actually count for diversity. So this is why diversification programs, notions that we need to be different and plural and more understanding, usually don't actually change the populations. So in the United States, a sociologist named Eduardo Benilla Silva uh, developed this concept of white habitus. He defines white habitus as a racialized, uninterrupted socialization process that conditions and creates whites' racial tastes, perceptions, feelings, and emotions, and their views on racial matters. The most pronounced effect of white habitus is that it promotes a sense of group belonging, a white culture of solidarity, and negative views about non-whites. In these all-white spaces, whites become the standard or norm while anything or anyone different becomes unnatural and problematic. So because of white habitus, racially homogenous spaces get to decide which ideas come in, which ideas they feel to be threatening, which ideas fundamentally challenge the core of what that group feels that they are or what they wish to be. So the diversification actually reifies the homogeneity of whiteness is preserved rather than interrupted. And this often happens around the concept in the category of gender. Because race is a rupture, somatically and culturally, in the replication of social processes and philosophies in most universities in the UK, blackness being outside, representing something dangerous, something historically deviant, problematizes the presumed hierarchies of disadvantage that are coded as difference between whites. And this is, this is extremely important because I think that when we talk about the notion of diversity, we often describe bodies, whether some bodies fit, some bodies don't fit. But rarely do we talk about the histories and the worldviews that bodies bring into certain locations. So if you talk about the process of colonization or genocide because of racism, then you're not going to get the same kind of bourgeois notions of class difference or gender that you may have amongst white populations. Said differently, if you look at the history of feminism or the history of white women in the United States right now under Trump, those are not gonna be the most liberal populations. 
But when we theorize them, when we think about their relationship to other racial groups, we assume that there's a natural allegiance because all these groups are excluded, all these groups are discriminated against, all these groups are oppressed. There's going to be a fundamental difference that cannot be accommodated by the systems that we already have in place. And this is the important part of diversification, that there's not just the preservation of a certain demographic population, but there's also this impetus to preserve the ideas that that population has given us. There's this idea that the curricula, that the canon of philosophy, that the ways that we talk about diversity and what counts as difference is in fact accurate, even though there's no one who's actually different formulating those rules itself. So when we talk then about anti-blackness, or we talk about indigeneity, or we talk about not belonging or immigrants, we're not simply talking about bodies of inclusion. We're talking about a process of empire. We're talking about histories that have reified certain things that we pretend are contingent within white society, philosophy, and their ideations. It approaches the limit of the idea and exposes the inapplicability of the universal assumptions that were formulated on white people and the intuitions to anyone else but white people. But this rupture is, is not simply political. Often when we talk about diversity, we talk of it as if it's a political mandate, that you have to have the right liberal politics to incorporate certain bodies, black male bodies, black female bodies, Muslims. You have to be on the right side of the political spectrum. But what concretely changes about the way the society is organized? Very little. The ways that institutions legitimize themselves is through the ideological effect of saying that, yes, we're inclusive, because that allows even people who are fundamentally discriminated against and killed by the police state, by the people who don't warn certain people on college campuses or in certain neighborhoods, to appear as if they didn't pull the trigger themselves or put the person in jail or stab them. They don't have guns in the society the same way we do in America. Forgive me. All right? But at the same time, that's not full, you're not fully absolved. Because the mandate for why the police act the way they do, the mandate for why certain institutions act the way they do, is to preserve the certain kinds of ideologies that have already been established amongst their white citizens, their, their specific clientele. So we need a schematic rupture. What do I mean by that? Well, if we're going to start being serious about diversity, then we have to admit that the process of colonization and empire created these ideas that we hold so dearly and is also the engine driving the exclusion of black and brown and Muslim bodies, that those ideas themselves may be the problem. That there's a falsity in the illusion that Europe has in fact created universal ideas that are interested in the problem of the human. Rather, Europeans created theories to talk about the problems of Europeans. So this involves an examination of the cultural imperialism on the concept of the human itself, constructs of gender, the way that class is encoded in different kinds of demographic uh, characteristics, the history of white men raping black men in Africa and throughout the diaspora, the homoeroticism involved in racial domination, the rape of black people by white women, the violence of white women as slave owners and colonizers, the racism and patriarchal imperialist ventures of suffragettes, and of course, capitalism. These are themes that fundamentally challenge the ways that we've articulated certain subjects. And philosophy is in dire need of a rigid empiricism that allows us to study subjects as they are, not as we imagine them to be. Said this way, decolonization then is not simply an invitation for wider working class solidarity. Drawing from rich black radical traditions, radical Muslim intellectual traditions, right? authors like Frantz Fanon, the Black Panthers, the echoes of people who fought for freedom in the Haitian Revolution in the late 1800s. This exposes to us that there is a very different train of thinking necessary to resurrect true humanity. In case you didn't know, Europe is a failed project. So the sociogenic principle that Fanon introduces us to in Black Skin, White Mass tells us that society's colonial and colonial powers create entities and ideologies to sustain their civilization and way of life. He says that this is their metaphysics, so to speak. Here, Sylvia Winter, borrowing from Fanon, indicts the very notion of the human, saying that while it may in fact have a biological origin, that what we do call and designate as biological is itself a cultural construct. So to build diversity off of the idea that there's just a shared biology, 
without the ability to recognize how ideas and trajectories, how different notions of history, how different problems with the status quo, the very problem of philosophy and thought itself, originates in a very specific time, as an effect of a very specific people, as a very specific set of triumphs, and then try to apply that to everyone else, is doomed from the very beginning. Said differently, if we're truly invested in diversity, then it means that we may have to speak about the inapplicability of European thought and perhaps the end of philosophy itself. Thank you. It's World Philosophy Day. We can't yeah. end philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> well, stranger things have happened. <laughs> You're, so you're questioning the very foundation upon which the idea of, of diversity has been overlaid. Mm -hmm. Is a search for commonalities possible, or is the alternative kind of perpetual strife? Well, I think we mentioned this a little bit before. Yeah. Uh, in, in respect for your country, your, your country is set up differently than mine. But I think that in America and various parts of Africa and the Caribbean, there is a renewal of the sense uh, for a certain kind of deep pessimism uh, about whether or not certain structures and really Europeans, be they American, you know, in the UK, et cetera, can actually change and understand difference. Uh, the recent things that we've discovered in the archives about slavery, about the use of black male and black female bodies, not only for sexual exploitation, but economic production, the ways that Afro-pessimists and, and critical race theorists are now talking about global structures of white supremacy. Uh, you know, Charles Mills, for instance, extending the racial polity to a global functioning society. There, it leaves little room to simply think that values and ideas push us into the right direction. It seems that white populations are extremely stubborn when it comes to deciding who's superior and who should occupy inferior ranks within the world. And I think that if we're serious about diversity, it can't simply be the replication of liberal ideas that say we want to include people into structures that we already know are felt or doing to them. You know, I know most people don't read Martin Luther King this way, but he starts off his last book with this very idea, right? That if you're, if you're trying to integrate black people, if you're trying to integrate the oppressed, people who have been exploited by colonization into empires and colonies, it requires them to basically lose their, their holders, their somebodies. And I think that even though I disagree with King about a lot of things, he's absolutely right about that position, that we have an irreconcilable problem with the idea that European structures and thought can incorporate racial and cultural difference. And then the material reality, which is that there always seems to be something lacking when those people, those bodies, those philosophical thoughts are held up for evaluation by, by white populations. And I think this works out politically where you see the, just the flat out elimination of, of Muslim people, of black people, of immigrant populations in the United States, simply because they, they pose a cultural threat to what's taken to be the white conservative Christian force in the country. And is this an analysis that you think can only be applied to European North American societies? Because if I think about other parts of the world that aren't so diverse, mm -hmm. India, Japan come to mind, um, they're actually often quite racist societies. Absolutely. And, and obviously in India, the, the colonial, and to some extent mm -hmm. Japan, the colonial experience applies. So it, is your analysis one that you would only apply to North America and Europe? Oh, well, you know, I study white people, so. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of difficult. I, I would certainly, I think, I think that there are other models like social dominance theory that shows that these hierarchies are reproducible in most Western societies, you know, even if they're in the East. Uh, and I think Sudanius does a great job convincing us of why hierarchies are re reproduce themselves in all societies. But I also think that when you're talking about global wealth, when you're talking about world system theories, the accumulation of core versus nations on the periphery, uh, then you're going to have to have a conversation, not just about the United States and Europe, but really all the kind of diasporas that you find white people in other post-colonial states involved in. Fascinating, well, lots to think about there. Kathleen, I've been turning my back on you. I feel rather rude, but please come and talk to us, Kathleen. Thank you. Okay, so um, seems to me the primary goal of diversity and inclusion, which is a buzzword, that we often hear in universities is, as Anora says, anti-discrimination. I take it that's the primary goal. And it seems to me that's a reasonable goal, which I have 
I have no problem with the goal. I have reservations about how it's actually carried out in, by institutions, but I don't really want to talk about that specifically today. What I want to focus on directly is two other domains, not institutions, um, but areas in which the rhetoric of diversity and inclusion is increasingly being used. So the first is the domain of sexual desire, um, the idea that people have a responsibility to make their sexual di desires more diverse and inclusive. And the second um, is the domain of concept application, uh, the idea that the application of certain concepts should be diverse and inclusive. So versions of both of those claims are made very often in relation to a debate in which I'm actively engaged, which I'm not going to address directly today, which is this question of whether trans women are literally women. Um, so for instance, philosopher Amir Srinivasan writes in the London Review of Books that trans women often face sexual exclusion from lesbian cis women. Um, so that's an example of a, a claim about sexual desires being exclusionary and they should be more diverse. Um, but I'm not talking about that issue. As I say, specifically, I want to widen out to the uh, uh, general question of whether it's appropriate to take the language of diversity and inclusion from institutions and then apply them to sexual desires or concept application. Um, so just to give a few examples quickly of what I'm talking about with respect to sexual desire, uh, philosopher Anne Cahill writes that economic status, degree of physical ability, ethnic identity, such sexual preferences can be deeply implicated in structures of inequality. Sheila Lintott and Sherry Irvin write that we must genuinely do the work of reshaping our desires by engaging in practices of appreciation of sexual subjects embodied in diverse bodies. And then with respect to the application of concepts, Catherine Jenkins writes, the task is to develop a suitably inclusive concept, and the, the example is of woman, um, one that avoids what we can call the inclusion problem. And Sally Haslanger says, retrospectively of her own account, by appropriating the terms woman and man, I problematically excluded some women from being counted as women. So as I say, I want to ask a general question, um, how best to assess these claims that both sexual desires and concept application should be like institutions, diverse and inclusive. So I thought I'd go back quickly to some ground that Nora's really already covered about what the point of diversity and inclusion talk is in relation to institutions. And I agree, it's primarily sought in the name of anti-discrimination. There may be other valuable byproducts like cultural diversity, intellectual diversity, political diversity, but I take it that institutions, although they think those are good things, that's not the primary reason that they're seeking uh, diversity. They're seeking diversity in order to ensure that people in structurally marginalized social groups aren't discriminated against. So following Andrew Altman, I will understand discrimination generally as acts, practices, or policies that wrongfully impose a relative disadvantage on persons based on their membership in a salient social group. Philosophers also distinguish between direct and indirect discrimination. So direct is where membership of the social group explicitly enters into the reasons or motivation for um, imposing the disadvantage, like I didn't, I didn't serve her at the bar because she was gay whatever. Indirect discrimination, there doesn't have to be a reference to reason or motivation in, 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 the, in the act. There's just a disproportionate disadvantage imposed on a particular set of people in virtue of their group membership. But uh, according to the law anyway, disproportionate disadvantage is not enough to establish indirect discrimination because it has to also be shown that the disproportionate proportionate disadvantage isn't justified in terms of some other valuable aim. So the UK Equality Act recognises that there may be circumstances in which you can legitimately exclude a certain group from a certain resource if there's a legitimate aim. So importing that back into the question of sexual desire and concept application, so starting with sexual desire, can we treat sexual desire as discriminatory in this sense or the, any of these senses because it's directed at, towards too narrow a set of body types or people. I think we should be cautious in a few respects. 
clearly there's nothing like direct discrimination going on. Normally, if you aren't sexually attracted to members of a particular group, it's not because you intend to disadvantage them. Perhaps it's true. Uh, I think that some sexual preferences are no, non-coincidentally related to wider structural patterns of injustice, prejudice, at least indirectly. So perhaps taken across the population, they do confer disproportionate disadvantage on particular groups. But equally, I think it's important to remember that sexual desires are nothing like acts. So it is legitimate to criticize an institution for indirectly uh, imposing disproportionate disadvantage on one group, because there's a genuine sense in which the institution could have done differently. But in contrast, I assume the direction of sexual desires, just having them, not necessarily enacting them, which is different, can't be changed for an individual past a certain point in development. So there's little point in trying to exhort individuals to change who or what they're attracted to. In fact, there's a name for that, and that's conversion therapy. So we can perhaps fruitfully try and alter the conditions under which sexual desire patterns form developmentally in the first place. Like we could stop objectifying women on a rampant scale in the media, and maybe that would help. But um, that's, that's not directed towards people or individuals. Turning now to the case of concepts, and the idea that the application of concepts should be diverse and inclusive. Can this be a form of discrimination? And can this be criticizable ethically? Sometimes I think yes. Individual discriminatory attitudes, either direct or indirect, can cause people to mis misapply concepts. So I think this is what um, Sojourner Truth draws attention to famously in her 1851 speech, Ain't I a Woman? When she points out that the idea that, I quote, women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere doesn't apply to her or isn't seen to apply to her as a former slave, and yet she's still a woman. So there is a sense in which applications of the concept of woman should be diverse and inclusionary or inclusive um, in the sense that the concept should be applied to everyone who satisfies whatever conditions properly underpin it. So it seems true that structural patterns of prejudice can interfere with the process of application. And I think we can also concede that sometimes the application of a concept to some people and not others uh, confers some advantages to, some, to those to whom the concept's applied uh, that are not applied to others. Arguably, in the case of women, these advantages are limited, but I won't get into that. So let's just assume for a sake of argument in being counted as a woman, I get a range of benefits that people who aren't counted as women do not. But that's not yet discrimination, because we also need to note that just as with institutions, there may be legitimate aims of people in applying certain concepts to certain groups, which means that any resultant disadvantage is not discrimination because it's not wrongful. And one aim of concept application surely has to be to pick out a distinctive group relative to rec recognizably important interests, to distinguish that group from other groups, which partly but not wholly resemble it, and so that we can name that group and use it in further ex explanations of aspects of the world. So we can track causal explanatory <coughs> properties uh, through very many discourses. So a main point of concepts is to pick out distinctive kinds of thing in the world. And sometimes the fact that our concept application might indirectly convey disadvantage is not in itself a reason to criticize the concept use because the concept use has a further valuable point. Moreover, if we ignore this and try and make a concept more diverse and inclusive, whilst ignoring the important work the concept does in classifying a distinctive kind of thing, then the concept use is likely to lose specificity and so perversely work against the original aim of making institutions more diverse and inclusive. Because how are institutions going to eliminate discrimination against margin marginalized groups successfully if they don't have the words or concepts to recognize those groups in their specificity and what makes them distinct from other groups. We need a vocabulary that recognizes differences. And a final point is this. It seems to me that the social pressure currently exerted on particular social groups, but not others, to make their sexual desires inclusive and diverse, and their concept application inclusive and diverse, is itself a form of indirect discrimination. That is, this pressure imposes a disproportionate disadvantage on one particular social group, but not others, 
they're expected to monitor their own sexual desires and improve them, or to mon monitor their language, to remove the capacity to refer to themselves. And true diversity in this domain would be to allow a rich vocabulary to refer to important differences, material, social, political, and to allow all marginalized social groups to have words that refer to them and them alone exclusively. You talk about a vocabulary that expresses difference, but who gets to define a concept group? Um, no, no one person, certainly, and no, not even one group. So, sorry. Um, I mean, gets to. We all do it all the time. We're constantly litigating concept use. I, I think most arguments in philosophy and in ethics are about proper application of concepts, trying to work out, you know, which concept fits this best, and that will be sometimes diverted by political interests um, and biases. But hopefully through a process of discussion and open consideration of all available options, we'll reach a point where we've got the right concept for the right phenomenon in the world. And as we've seen around that debate about trans women, if you exclude a group or you try to exclude a group from a concept, that's problematic in itself, isn't it? Well, it depends. I think what I'm trying to argue for is it depends on the reasons you're excluding them. I mean, there's a lot of rhetorical weight around exclusion. You could sort of metaphorically imagine something pushed out of a door and our concepts as these gates, they're not letting the people in. But our concepts aren't, that's what I'm trying to say, our concepts are not, they have a, they have an aim beyond making people feel included they have they have a, the point of a concept is to refer to a thing distinctively and to allow us to refer to that thing and not confuse it with other things with which it is importantly dissimilar so uh, yeah can can that concept change though i guess that's what i'm asking yeah concepts what, change all the time which is what many people perhaps in the trans community would argue concepts change all the time but we need to change them for the right reasons we mean we the sense in which it's good to change a concept is to sharpen it up so it becomes better responsive to some aspect of the world. And I mean the social world as well. I don't just mean like brute facts. But it, it would be wrong to, to sort of hijack a concept for political ends. And if you're going to try and do that, and I, there is a kind of move in philosophy at the moment to do this thing called conceptual engineering where you try and get better concepts for political ends, then you better make sure you're consulting all the people affected and not just a small group of them. And in terms of the debate, clearly there's a lot at stake for anybody who is involved in a conversation about a concept, about whether they belong, whether they don't belong. How do we have that conversation? Because I would argue, judging by the fact that I know, and you know that there are people who I'm not even sure you should be on this platform at all. How do we have that conversation in a way that is constructive? Well, I think you could ask them. <laughs> I mean, I'm doing my best. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's that. So I think, I mean, I'm up for talking to people that really disagree with me. So I think that's the important thing to not, not get into silos, not assume that disagreement is, um, is a, you know, a bad thing. Disagreement is not a bad thing. If I'm right, and what we're doing is trying to sharpen up our concepts to fit aspects of the world, then we need to expose our ideas to criticism. And so, and that goes for me, and that goes for the other side too. So we need to have some kind of dialogue, put the emotions slightly on the side. And so just one last question then, why do you think people describe you as transphobic? Because they haven't read my stuff properly. <laughs> So yeah, reject basically, the I reject the criticism, yes, I'm not transphobic, so. All right, I'm going to stop that bit of the conversation there. We're going to have a wider conversation. There will be questions from the floor. And I also want to mention, actually, if you've enjoyed what you've heard so far, uh, the Royal Institute of Philosophy is running a series of lectures through the winter into the new year, and they're on Fridays at Foils on Charing Cross Road. There are most Fridays, not all Fridays, but most. So do come along. Bit of a Bit of a conversation amongst all of us, I think. Um, Tommy, if you're thinking about what we've been hearing from Kathleen, to what extent do you accept then that there is this idea of, of concepts, of categories within diversity? And does that go some way to answering some of your concerns about how people define themselves? Uh, 
I think I, I just I think the histories are different. I don't I don't know if I would take the role of concepts and the way that we formulated them, you know, especially within philosophy, um, to be so separate from political, constitutional, or political ideas, right? I think I think there is intellectual work, but I, I agree that there is a way that we need to sharpen concepts. But I think what I what I'm what I try to push is that the seemingly neutral concept already has social, cultural, and psychological baggage with it. Uh, that it's precisely in the absence of certain groups of people that concepts become what they are, and then that poses or presents to the world uh, as being neutral. Uh, I, I guess one comment would be, so if, for, for example, if we're thinking about the histories of most groups of people, of the darker races, coming into contact with philosophy, uh, the initial impression with philosophy was that these people were savages, right? Uh, in many cases, if you're looking specifically at the history of UK and United States 19th century ethnology, uh, the very idea that racialized groups were inferior was in, an indication that those groups were in fact feminine. Um, how do we translate that into our concepts today? So if we take, for example, arguments about women or femininity, and we suggest that this holds some kind of work to be done in looking in the world and looking at inequality to the world, if you go back 50 to 60 years, right, and even in the mid 20th century, the debates about whether or not certain racialized populations, men in India were more feminine than European women, black men in turn of the century were more feminine, right? This, because there was a claiming from suffragettes, they were claiming from white women who formed WKKK, they were patriarchal and civilized, poverty. What, how do we understand that concept? Like what work can it do unless we presuppose that it points to the objects, to the debates that we have in our current time? And I think that's where philosophy gets sloppy. I think that if we're going to be serious about concepts doing work and then concepts having the power to diversify things, and we have to look at all the, the structures, all the overlines, be it economic, political, historical, et cetera, that that concept brings with it, that concept's bringing baggage, and if not, some of the same kinds of biases and, and disease that we're trying to analyze. So do you think that the Equality Act, which Nora and Neil began with, it, it feels very blunt in the complicated mm -hmm. world that you present? It, but, but I guess this is the problem that I have with, with, with questions of discrimination, right? So I can have very good, good concepts or laws that say we should not discriminate against certain groups of people. But then I can also achieve that by just not putting any of those people in contact with the people who would do the discriminating. And that's the piece that I don't think that we often get in our social, and our notions of social equality and social diagnosis. We can have a very good liberal legal system, our formalist language, but what gets to the undercurrents of how the society is actually structured? If I want to eliminate racism in UK universities, I could just as easily say, well, we don't have very many black people, so we generally think we're doing a very good job because nobody's filing, you know, I don't, in America would be Title VII or EEOC discrimination suits, right? And that will constitute the same kind of progression. You would have to talk about representation. And you have all kinds of arguments about merit and fairness, et cetera, that may not be applied equally, but certainly don't expose themselves to deliberate, disparate, and intentional malicious discrimination towards those groups. So I think that is a very, it's a good formalist indication of how people shouldn't be approached with negative sentiment or malice intent, but it doesn't talk about the ways that the society and the institutions are fundamentally constituted within anti-Islamic, anti-black, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, types of traditions where those populations are absent from the beginning. And Aura O'Neill, if we go back to this idea of, of diversity being a, a concept that was created to deal with institutions and the law to that extent, as you describe it, uh, works in that way, where does it then leave the academic world? Let's take a concrete example. And, and this idea that if, if you accept that the institution itself is on a flawed structure, then where does that leave the relationship between, I don't know, a, a department and its students, or, or, and, and then the curriculum? Can you begin to have those conversations if, if, if you think that the structure beneath it is, is very wobbly? <coughs> When one has to have difficult conversations, one often has to have difficult conversations, I suspect uh, less formal approaches are on the whole more useful. Uh, and I have known people who you might think wouldn't talk to one another much learn to do it. And I think that that sort of social learning is extremely valuable, difficult, and fostering it is hard going. But that's where I'd see the value of. Talking to one another and having conversations about the things that... Do you, do you know, I'd even say listening to one another. <laughs> <laughs> listening. Uh, Kathleen Stock, then, in a sense, is if, 
if you accept Tommy Curry's analysis of the situation, is the area that you're looking at, looking at these definitions, the evolution of definitions, is that, are you kind of looking down from 2,000 miles, looking down on a, that's over there, and he's dealing with something that's well below the surface? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think I agree with quite a lot of what Tommy said, so... Thank you. We've only <laughs> I mean, just met, so... <laughs> I mean, I, I certainly agree with the idea that, and I hope, I want to reiterate if it didn't come across, that the way that we apply concepts or try and construct them can be completely hijacked by special interests in a way that looks completely neutral to the people that use them and they don't realize the benefits that they're conferring for the groups that they're conferring them. I mean, that's absolutely true. And I see the benefit of these conversations and the interrogation of the history of the concepts um, that you're, I think you're suggesting as complete as really important in exposing um, sort of fake interests and real interests. Like what I mean by real interests is that they make human life go better for everybody and not for some particularly powerful group that gets to construct the language the way they want to and gets to um, use language as a tool to refer to the things that they want to refer to them. I mean, that's how propaganda is used all the time. And I'm, I, you know, I, I don't like that at all. So, so I don't think we're very different, and I don't think I'm talking from 2,000 miles in the air. So, so one fairly superficial question, in a sense, an easy question, and then I'll open it up to the floor, which is the, the criticism that's levelled at people all the time when we talk about diversity, which is actually, by emphasising difference, all we're doing is encouraging conflict, and that diversity is the problem, the constant conversation about diversity. Kathleen? I don't think that's the source of the conflict. I think that we're just, there's a huge amount of defensiveness involved. And perhaps philosophers haven't done a very good job in explaining what's at stake in a way that doesn't inflame things either. But I don't think it's the fact we're talking about discrimination and uh, injustice that is causing, well, maybe it is causing it, but I'm, I don't care in that case. We just still have to have the conversations and we have to try and find a way of managing the discord. Tommy? Yeah, I think, um... You know, when, when, you're look, when you're looking at those kinds of excuses, I, I'm really an empiricist as a part of this matter, right? You know, you're, I, I find that a lot of what philosophy does is create apologetics and rationalizations for certain people being absent, right? And, and I, I could go back to the 18th century, that's just traditionally what the European tradition has done. Um, in that sense, I think that the person claiming that diversity is the problem is making a radical argument endorsing the status quo. Uh, because it really does take a disassociation from the real world and social phenomena where people are suffering and dying, uh, being killed because of their religious affiliation, because of the color of their skin, to say that that is caused by an endorsement of inclusion rather than trying to end some of these categories of difference in racism and xenophobia that are being policed and managed through violence and death. Laura O'Neill? I suppose I have never thought of Sorry, I lean closer to this apparatus. I've never thought of diversity as the problem. I think that uh, it's rather that uh, what the, the contemporary uh, rhetoric about diversity is much more about respect for diversity than it is about seeing diversity as a problem. And whether that's achieved in practice is, of course, as we know, quite another thing. But mm -hmm. I don't think people are arguing, uh, or, and I don't think the people who drafted the equalities legislation here were thinking that diversity was a problem. Rather the contrary, it was ignoring diversity, it was not noticing uh, the specific features of other people. Now the legislation, like all legislation, is um, simplistic. It has to be simplistic. One can't take account of the full range of ways in which we are all gloriously different from one another. But it did pick out a certain range of ways. What is quite interesting when one looks at it with a historical lens is it isn't the same set of ways that people would have taken account of at certain periods of the past. I remember reading that um, in 19th century Brazil, somebody had worked out an eightfold racial classification. Now that is, uh, you may say, making life far too complicated, but it was done. Uh, we tend to think, no, 
uh, that probably was not a positive step. But um, so I don't think when people uh, talk about diversity, many of them are thinking we should uh, go for maximizing diversity. They're thinking about we shouldn't overlook the diversity that people actually have. And that's why it's so deeply linked to the anti-discrimination literature. I think there's so much to think about there. We definitely, no question there's a point to diversity, but we've talked so much about how diversity applies, what it brings to society, and how, in a sense, it's evolving, evolving our conversations, and whether, in a sense, it addresses some of the fundamental problems that we face at all. Um, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Do go along to some of those other Royal Institute lectures if you can. Thank you very much for coming and uh, for being such a great audience. Thank you.